I got a question for you. Okay. How is your aquifer down back there? Are you limited on the water pretty heavy? Or? Well, we have, I, I've got all sorts of other slides that I could show you, but um, we essentially have declining water in many parts of Nebraska in the aquifer. Again, we go from 15 inches of rainfall at Scotts Bluff, eastern Nebraska at Falls City by Missouri gets 36 inches. So we get more recharge in eastern Nebraska. Eastern Nebraska only needs to pump about eight inches of water if they water effectively. But even around York, Nebraska, Hastings, some of that area is declining. But essentially three quarters of Nebraska is under groundwater management. Most of them have pumping restrictions. In Scotts Bluff, our current allocation is 14 inches. We look for those to continue to go down in the future because the idea is to get some water is better than none. Nebraska treats water like a scarce resource. We did not treat it like Texas did with both oil and water where they pumped it. You go down around Hereford, Texas, where they used to irrigate, they've pumped out all the water. It's now all dry land. The idea is that as technology improves and changes, better hybrids, we can maybe grow better crops in the future with 20% less water than now. So the idea is to extend it as long as you can. And these decisions are made primarily by farmer boards, and they've bought in. Do either of you know your oil content percent in your film that you've got? Have you tested that? What have, where have you been getting on average over the years? Um, with, with the varieties we first started out with, we're in the low 30s, but it's it's moved up uh, with some of the newer varieties and uh, um, for for crushing, uh, that's, that's really important. That, that was where I was asked one of the questions earlier is, is it's really important to get a higher oil content because that's that's 60% uh, of the revenue on, on the crushing side of it. So how are you at then now that you got we've, we've, we've seen it as high as 38%, okay. yeah. And then, I don't know, it's hard to say, Odessa Union, they have their own spectral moment or whatever, however you measure oil content. And we're anywhere, at least on this winter variety of, that Jack's put out, either Athena or Amanda, we've been between 42 and 44 percent. That's good. That's you know, and that, as a grower, that's, you know, I, I wish it'd be structured towards hard red winter premiums, DNS premiums, where the higher the oil content, the more you get paid, and if you haul Ted junk, mm -hmm. you're going to get paid junk. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's one thing that came up. We were talking with another crusher. I don't know if he's in here. It's uh, Tim King. Is that, he's up by the Canadian border. Mm -hmm. Is that where he is? Yeah. He was talking about how he can get higher oil content seed out of Canada. And the reason was, he said, that they get later rains than we do down here. And it was that last shot of water, which if you're irrigating, you could maybe control uh, when the seed's developing, that he resulted in a better oil content. Now, I didn't know if either of you had experimented with that or found that. Well, you know, I mentioned earlier, one, one of the things, we use wheel lines, and right. once that canola gets up so far, right. we, we can't irrigate it. So that, okay. that may be the fact, we have crushed seed that's gone up to 42% oil, but it wasn't our, I mean, it wasn't our seed. But uh, just, you know, one of, one of the things that we alluded to was water management. We're in the Acoma Valley, all of our the water comes from snowpack in the mountains. We've been blessed with a lot of snow the last few years, but we've had years when it was very grim. And if we can use that water on some of the other permanent crops and and uh, grow your canola and shut you know shut your shut your water off, uh, it, it, say in May, and finish that crop out and use that water somewhere else, and it's very beneficial. Uh, in June and July, when the heavy heavy users of water are, and it's just like you know, you run into with, with potatoes. You don't tend to give a late shot. Yeah, I do. I, I when it's he blooming heavily, I don't want to water it. You know, and it was alluded to today why yeah. you do not want to water while it's blooming. As soon as it quits blooming, if I got the water available, I'll throw an inch down, make sure I got enough to fill the pot so that the plant isn't stressed. Yeah, yeah see, I don't have that ability you to do don't that. Have that luxury. Yeah, right. unless you go through with the hand lines, and that's right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that ain't gonna happen. Oil. Right. And he was talking about the premium idea mm -hmm. too. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. get a premium for the higher yeah. oil seed content. He was talking about a little MRI type, uh, uh, what is it, magnetic resonance uh, NMR. tester for oil? It's an NMR nuclear magnetic resonance. I work with Dr. Jack Brown. Okay. Okay. And yeah, every little quick, we have an NIR too, so near infrared. 
analyzer, and they give us different numbers because you know they're looking at certain different things. So if everybody used like the same piece of equipment to do oil content, maybe the premium would work, but you know Canada uses something different than we do. So. And the other thing with adding the last shot of water, you have to be careful. Some varieties, I had this happen in the greenhouse. The seeds germinate in pots. No. The gentleman with the circle, have you run any uh, liquid nitrogen or uh, liquid sulfur through your circle, or have you concentrated only on dry? Only on dry, Dallas, you, you can probably allude to that. Um, I've done it before, where I put about 15 pounds in, I put it in your lid, and I'll put it on, and I see about maybe 10, 15% blooms out there. Um, only reason I've done that is that I like, raised the screen home, but so maybe not for one time, and that's how they had me do it. But you don't put any sulfur with it? Um, a, little bit, a little bit of sulfur with it when you use liquid urea. I think if you use like 15 pounds, you have like 15 pounds of sulfur with it. So it's a good idea. One thing you have to watch on your uh, liquid applications of nitrogen, especially on winter canola, is your demand curve as the plant is pulling that. And that's why Jeff fertilizes very early. Uh, because if you don't get your nitrogen in the soil so a plant can pull it up, you're not going to get the benefit out of it. That's right. Yeah. It takes all its, its first bullets. Oh, yeah. 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 You tried your hand in spring. I've done all of Yeah, I, I did. I, I a circle one year, I'd lost 20 acres. So I just went in, got 20 acres. I, I don't even remember what the variety was or anything. I just needed to see. 20 acres, so I wedged out a, a circle, put that 20 acres in, harvested the winter canola, and that stuff was still there, got all the water at one. Well, it turned off to be 100 to 105 degrees. The ground was saturated, the ground was black to the top, it fried the blooms mm. to the plant. You know, shoot, you know, around Odessa this year, there's, there was a lot of spring canola growing, hybrid, male, female, and it was, it was a good spring for it, because it was cool, the summer was cool. Next year, they could get bit in the butt. Yeah, well, we could, like you say, we do the spring canola seed thing. And the first year we seeded, I think it was April 20th or something, too late, got it with the heat. So we moved our seeding dates up three weeks this year, in mm. 2012, to April 1st or 4th, and that, that really saved a lot of our crop from that extreme heat. Yeah, but that, that year I did it, I got 400 pounds and we were out there with two combines and the hired man said to me, he says, I think I got a hole. And I said, if you think you got a hole, I got a hole in my combine. Yeah, yeah. There was just, <laughs> that was a waste of time. I hate to say it. Yeah. We ran into the same thing with spring canola. Uh, and remember the date was May 9th. It hit 90 degrees and it just shut the bloom off. Nothing after that. And, and that's something else about winter canola. Anybody in agronomy, Galen knows since I deal with seed. You have more, you have a couple of days of temperature more than 88 degrees out there. You're done. Mm -hmm. I don't care how much water you pour on that canola. It's yeah. done blooming. Mm -hmm. That happened to me six, seven years ago. It was blooming for 10 days, and boom, we got hit for three days in a row of 90 plus degree weather. And that's that was it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Frost. Blooming time. No, we, we, that, that we have not had a problem with. I dealt with it. It's, it's a sad situation when you go out there in the morning, and you know you got frost, and instead of these blooms being up like this, they're like, like this. You know, as soon as it warms up, they'll go up like this, but a week or two down the road when they throw those little blooms and you start wanting to form a pod, <laughs> your pod is going to be about an inch long and about the size of, a needle there's just nothing there you know and you can you can see every plant like that and then it'll just take off and it's just whatever stage that that plant is in when that frost hits <laughs>